Joe Gardner from Covers & Co. Today we wanted to touch on an exciting new intercrop that we've been working on for some time, which is a glyphosate tolerant forage soybean intercropped with corn. What makes forage soybeans different than grain soybeans is they stay vegetative longer. So the bean we use does not trigger reproduction until over 100 days, whereas a grain soybean triggers reproduction about the summer solstice. Why is that important? A vegetative plant that isn't flowering captures sunlight energy and releases a portion of that energy into the soil to feed the soil microbes. When we're talking about a legume, that means we're feeding the rhizobium bacteria that's responsible for capturing nitrogen out of the atmosphere. Of course, we talk all the time about carbon to nitrogen ratio and the importance of balancing this ratio to have a balanced uh, energy sources for our biology. So we have corn, which is a high carbon, low nitrogen plant. And then we, of course, have a vegetative soybean, which is a legume, which is low carbon and high nitrogen. So what this does is it gives the soil biology a balanced energy and protein source. Um, now the biology can create stable soil aggregates, creating a functioning soil, uh, which infiltrates water better, nitrogen better, and breaks down plant residue. So seeding dates, I think everyone's pretty familiar on corn seeding dates, usually happens mid-May or later. So the soybeans, we want to get in the ground either a day before or a day after. So on my farm, we put down the soybeans with our fertilizer the day before uh, the corn planter gets there. But there are lots of farms that put it in a day or two after. We actually had a farm from this summer take the planter out when the corn was about V5 and sow the soybeans between the rows. As you can see, the corn did have quite a, a head start and it probably had an effect on the amount of soybean biomass, but we still achieved pretty desirable results, which is the soybeans capturing the sunlight that the corn isn't. An important note when intercropping with corn is to sow the rows north and south. Because the sun travels around the southern horizon, it gives us the ability to have sunlight shine directly down the rows at least once a day. You can see from these photos, same field, same corn intercrop. You can see the difference in sunlight north-south versus the headlands, which were east-west. So getting into the uses and the growing season, this is a video of a corn forage soybean intercrop that is being taken for silage. So as you can see, there's a substantial amount of beans that are being pulled into the header, which is heading into the silage pile, which is great for increasing uh, protein in our feed source. But as you can see there, uh, behind the header, we are still leaving a decent amount of residue behind to keep that soil protected from wind and water erosion. Here's a better video of what I'm talking about. You see the, the soybean biomass mass left behind that we can graze or leave to be broken down um, residual N or feeding that soil biology. We did see from that trial uh, an increase in the protein of the corn silage. So whereas corn generally runs between, you know, seven and 8% protein, we were seeing a protein levels in this corn of 9.5%, which is pretty exciting when we consider corn is high energy, but lacking in protein. So this is a time-lapse video from this summer. We get asked quite often, are the beans not gonna compete with the corn? As you can see here, the corn establishes early, grows taller, roots deeper. So really the corn is not affected by the soybean growth. What is happening and the purpose of the blend is the, the soybeans grow between the corn rows and capture any sunlight that would otherwise be hitting the soil surface. So we're just increasing our sunlight use efficiency by having the soybeans in position to capture whatever sunlight the corn doesn't. As we talked about with vegetative versus re reproductive stages, these beans stay or stay vegetative, excuse me, for longer in the season. So uh, in wide row corn, like we see here, we were seeing substantial amounts of residual nitrogen, up to 50 pounds in this example. And in 30 inch corn, which is obviously more common, we were seeing nitrogen, you know, 25 to 27 parts per million. 
at a trial we did at Hartney, Manitoba this year, we saw residual nitrogen levels at 50 pounds. And I think something important is we come back to these fields in the spring and actually start to measure residual N levels once that soybean biomass starts to break down. I think these numbers are likely a little light and it'll be exciting to get the data and, and prove this out. So why did frost kill the corn and not the soybeans? So we saw this across every trial. Um, we saw mid-September temperatures of negative one, which turned the corn from lush green to brown, but did not seem to have any effect on the forage soybeans in the canopy. So you can see on the picture on the right, the beans are turning yellow. They were nipped by the frost where there was no corn, but you look further into the canopy and the beans are still lush green and photosynthesizing. So just an interesting observation. What happened? I've asked a lot of smart people and nobody seems to have uh, a definitive answer, but just a neat observation we saw from this growing season. So the benefits of this intercrop, of course, the number one thing is we have a herbicide option. So we can grow a high carbon plant and a low carbon plant, maximizing the C-to-N ratio and still achieve a clean field because we're able to use glyphosate. Increased protein and silage is of course a massive benefit when the biggest limiting factor with corn silage is the low protein levels. So increasing those levels even a 1% or 2% can make a big difference as far as winter feed cost. Residual nitrogen, as I touched on, I think is going to be a big player in this intercrop. We'll see what the soil tests say come spring, but of course every pound of nitrogen we can uh, grow ourselves is a pound of nitrogen we don't have to purchase from our local input. Grazing options after corn silage, I think as you saw in those videos, there was a decent amount of forage soybeans that didn't end up uh, getting chopped. It's a really great option to kick the cows out after and clean up that residue or leave the residue to protect that soil and feed that soil biology for next year. And we talked about soil cover and balance C to N, both massive benefits, keeping a active biology in the soil, stable soil aggregates, so there is now pore space for biology to move, for water to infiltrate, for nitrogen to infiltrate, and all the benefits that come with a stimulated soil biology. And as with all intercropping or cover cropping, the government does have funding available for farms that are wanting to try and virtually eliminate your risk on this intercrop. So reach out to your local watershed if you're in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, or your local RDAR office if you're in Alberta to access some of these funds that are going towards cover cropping. That's our video on forage soybeans intercrop with corn. To learn more, head to coversandco.ca or talk to a local dealer. Thanks a lot for your time. Have a great day.